Thank you for that prayer. We're today in Luke chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 29 through 40. Maybe go a little past 40 if I have time. Uh, the great triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday. That's, uh, that's the subject. And uh, you probably know all about it. But uh, you, you might learn something today that you don't know. So because it's got to be a great, great event. It's carried, it's presented in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John presents this. And there's, you know, it's, it's about, uh, we're going to start off, I'm going to start off in verse, uh, <coughs> verse 29 where it says, and he came to pass, verse 29, if I read from the quarterly, it says, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and so on. All right, so, uh, but what happens is even before that time, I want to back us up to the Friday night <clears throat> because it's on, it's on Sunday morning that he gets the pony and they go into Jerusalem. If we go back to Friday night, he's in Bethany right here. Uh, he came from Jericho. <clears throat> Jericho, remember Zacchaeus and Jericho? He came from Jericho, which is up this way, and he comes this way. The Jericho road goes like this through Bethany up to Jericho from Jerusalem this way. And so they came this way to Bethany, and this is his headquarters. This will be his headquarters all throughout the rest of the week before his crucifixion. Every day he goes back to Bethany. It's only two miles. And they walk two miles every day uh, going to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, and then coming back at night. This was uh, his, uh, and, and usually, and it's believed that he was in the house of uh, where Lazarus, the house of Lazarus, uh, Martha and Mary. Remember Martha and Mary, the brother, uh, the sisters of Lazarus. That's their home, and he usually went there. Uh, another one of the other accounts, John tells us that he was in the house of Lazarus, and then uh, other accounts said in the house of uh, uh, a leper, Simon the leper. And the only way you can kind of, if you try to bring that together, is the commentary says, well, Simon must have been the father of Lazarus. You know, that's just one house. Whatever it was, it was in Bethany right here. And, and I take it to mean it was in the house of Lazarus because it says Lazarus was there. And John tells us in the other Gospels, the woman who breaks the ornament at his feet and anoints him, uh, they don't name her, but John names her. You know, and I, I guess it never, you know, registered with me over the years. John named her as Mary, brother of Lazarus. I mean, sister, sister of Lazarus, Mary, right here. So there they are. And so this is six days. Let me put that up. They're there six days before the Passover. So they start out. And so in our lesson today, we're starting here. He goes up, this two routes that you can go into Jerusalem, either this way or this way. So he goes up this way to the mountain. When he gets up this far, it's not too far from the city. He sends uh, two of his disciples to get that, that little donkey, the coat. All right? And so that's the background uh, a little bit. One more thing I'd like to say, it's not in the lesson, but... When, when Mary anoints him with that expensive ointment, it's like a, a year's salary. So whatever your, your salary might have been, that's how much she had in pouring that out on his feet and anointing him, maybe on his body. And then uh, all of the disciples complained about it, Judas particularly. But all of them, if you look at all the record, they all complained about it. And Jesus rebuked them. He used the word an heiress, imperative he says leave her alone because she's done a good thing to me for my burial anointing him for his burial so they did do that with perfumes when they got a body ready for burial all we have today now is formaldehyde and flowers <laughs> you know but anyway expensive so that's that's where he's coming from he's, he's already been anointed here and the other gospel writers might have it later, but uh, John has it here. So we're going to take that. And he's up here now, and, he's, and that's where we come into our lesson. Now, one more thing. 
before we get that coat and get on that coat. Uh, it's funny because the lesson said they helped him onto the coat. And I couldn't handle that, Jimmy, where they had to help Jesus on the coat. And verse 35 says, they helped Jesus get on. You know, you could have got on the coat, couldn't you? But anyway, you consider them small donkeys. Maybe used to. But now, <laughs> maybe used to. And here's the point. The scriptures is, is twofold. We're talking about a procession coming from here, coming in on that. It's, it's on that Sunday morning, Palm Sunday morning. He's coming riding that coat, that little donkey, coming in here, and there's a procession. And we, we're, a great deal of the lessons about the procession. And it's twofold about that procession. While he was back here in Bethany, the scripture teaches that they heard the the crowd in Jerusalem heard that he was in Bethany, that he'd come up from and, into Bethany. And this is also a time when Lazarus had already been raised from the dead. That had taken place previous. Not that day, but previous, okay? So because John tells us that the crowd over here heard that he was there, so they took off. And this is, this is on that day right here on Friday. This is Friday, six days before, uh, before the Passover. And so they get out here early before Jesus even leaves Bethany, that crowd. And he said they wanted to go and hear Jesus. They brought people just like they always did to be healed and that kind of thing. They showed up, you know. They found out he was there and they showed up. Plus, the scriptures tells us, John tells us, they wanted to see Lazarus. Wouldn't you want to see Lazarus? Uh, you know, so a lot of that was curiosity. <clears throat> Because the crowd that will praise him that day, a week later, will cry out, crucify him. So, you know, the fickleness of the crowd sometimes. Because there's people who have curiosity, they show up. They're spectators, so they show up. They're not always, you know, uh, devoted in their heart uh, to those things. But that, that you have a big crowd coming this way. Now, when that happens, guess what? You know, the Pharisees really shook up about this. They, they know about Lazarus. They know he's down there alive. And now they're plotting to kill Lazarus. you got to get rid of the evidence. And Lazarus is walking around. And he was dead four days. He had been buried four days. And so the scripture tells us that they were plotting to kill Lazarus. They were already plotting to kill Jesus. And so when they saw that crowd, that's their crowd. That's their congregation. And they're jealous and, and they're, you know, they're bitter and angry and, and, you know, all upset. So they're seeing all their crowd go down here. So they go down. And some of them go down here. You know, they want to see what's going on. And then as Jesus begins on that Friday to make that journey this way, because he goes up into this, this is a mount. He goes up this way. That crowd's following him. And as he goes, the scripture says, as he goes, there was those all along the way, you have villages all in here, people where they, you know, people live, all these residences, they begin to join in. And so by the time you get to Jerusalem, it is a huge crowd of people uh, following him going into Jerusalem. And it said they would, uh, they cut off the palm branches, you know, that's what we call it, palm sun, and they laid it on the ground there. They took off the outer garments and they put it, laid it out there, the red carpet treatment. He's coming into Jerusalem. And so it should have been. Jesus never did encourage fanfare. He never did. Because he knew what was in man. He couldn't trust himself to man because he knew the heart of every man. Even his disciples, because I said already, they're complaining because the woman spent all that money on Jesus' anointing. But then his disciples refused to believe that Jesus was going up to Jerusalem to die. Far from that. Remember Peter said that. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Remember that. Over and over. This is a number of times in the scripture, in the Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus began to tell them that he was going up to Jerusalem and he would be uh, rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees. He would suffer and he would die. And on the third day, he would be raised again. He told them all of that. And they didn't seem to get it. It's hard for us to understand maybe where they were. They, they considered him the Messiah. Jesus, uh, Peter had confessed, uh, Jesus said, who, who do you think I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Okay, he got that right. 
but he, he immediately began to refuse that idea that there would be a Messiah who had to die. They wanted a Messiah who would reign over their enemies and not a Messiah who, who would die at the hands of their enemies. They didn't understand, like so many of us, that there's a, there, there's a, uh, there's a cross before there's a crown, right? The crown's coming, but right now he's not going to be crowned king, although he's being proclaimed king. But he's a king that's coming to die. And that's different than anything they understood. Although it certainly was in the scripture, but it was hid from them. It was de definitely hid from them. There's some things in scripture that's hid from you until you truly seek it in your heart. There's some things that you will never know until you truly seek it in your heart. If you're showing up out of curiosity or just uh, you know, being a participator, you'll never know. You can read the scripture every day, never know. And there's something about that. The Holy Spirit has to reveal that to our heart. Jesus said on one occasion, you do err. You're, you're in, you're, you're, you, you do err, meaning you're wrong. You go wrong in your theology. You do err not knowing the scriptures and not knowing the power of God. Those two things. We've got to know the scripture, but we have to know the power of God too. The power of the resurrection. You do err not knowing the scriptures and not knowing the power of God. Remember in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, In the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Remember that? And having, a power, and having, a, having an appearance godliness. of godliness, a form of godliness. form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And so that tells us that in the last days of the church age, there's going to be a big show. A great performance. People love performances. That's why some of them would go out to Bethany and walk two miles to see Lazarus. You know, it's a circus. People have, and it's, a, it's a theater. It is a performance. But where's the power of God? Where's the conviction? Where's the conversions? The, the true conversions. You know, it's not about whether, oh, I decided to follow Jesus. Well, what about him? He says, I never knew you, <laughs> you workers of iniquity. What about him? He comes to us. That's how he knocks. It's not about you. It's about him and whether you're going to uh, respond to what he's doing in your life. But the Holy Spirit of God, we need revival. You know, it's not, uh, you, you might say, well, how are we going to clean up this America that we're living in right now? And somebody said, well, we have to kill all the Democrats. Well, no, that's not the answer. You have to might get all of them in Washington, D.C., but the other answer is revival. You know, we ought to be praying for revival, revival, revival. You know, if the churches of America was really experienced with true revival, this nation would turn around quick. You know, as goes the priest, so goes the people. Too bad, you know, because the people kind of require certain people to be their preachers. You know, I know you're going to be a pastor. People want a certain pastor says, you know, and scratch my itch. You know, say the things that makes me feel good. You know, Jesus said, what did you think you, when you went out to see John the Baptist? Did you think you were going to see a guy with a, a real nice three-piece suit? No, you saw a prophet, you know, in, in, in leather clothing and eating locusts and, 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 and honey for food. John the Baptist was a preacher. He cried out to Israel, repent. Don't come here showing some outward sign and nothing in, inside. And see, that's, that was the decay of Israel at that time. That, uh, Jesus later on, he, later on this week, uh, this, this Passion Week, there will be a time when he teaches human, uh, 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 humongous, uh, he, he teaches many, many doctrines. A great number of doctrines, like the Olivet Discord, but there's a time when he confronts the Pharisees and the, uh, the Sadducees, and he calls them hypocrites. Remember that? Woe unto you, scribes, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. He really lays it all out there in plain language to them. You're like dead men's bones. You're, uh, why did sepulchres uh, sepulchres on the outside? It looks good underneath. You're dead man's bones. And he confronted them. You are the, of your father the devil. You know, and that's what he said to them. That ought to stir them up. He stirred them up. Not just kicking over the money changers and running out 
you know, the people out of the court of the Gentiles, but uh, he stirred them up. And he, and he was ready to, he, he came to Jerusalem, he came to die. And he did stir them up because they were, according to the scripture, they were planning to kill him after the Passover. And that could never be. You know why? He had to die on the day of Passover because he was the Paschal Lamb of Israel. He was going to die on that day. Look at this. On 9 and 10, that's the Jewish calendar. When the Passover lambs were being presented at the temple and they were selected by the priest, they had to be without blemish. Remember that? Without blemish. So they were selecting all these lambs because they killed a lot of lambs that day. The Passover lambs because all the families had to have lambs. And so they brought all these lambs and they presented it to the priest and they were selected. And this is the same day. The same day that they, all these families were bringing their lambs, the Passover lambs. That same day Jesus is presented to Israel. And that's our lesson today. He is being presented to Israel. He's riding on that coat. That little donkey coming into Jerusalem. And there's a great fanfare for him. There's a great number, a multitude of people who are crying out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of our father David. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. And so they're proclaiming him Messiah. Now the Messiah is here at last, the king. And so none of them understood that he was the lamb that was about to be killed. But nevertheless, he's being presented to Israel at that time as Israel's paschal lamb. Not only that, when he's being presented, that's when they're presenting their lambs and the, the lambs are being accepted. And then on the 14th of Nisan, I mean, that's seven days later, one week, so seven days, 14, what happens? Jesus dies on the cross. On the 14th. On the 14th. He's slain. That's when they sl started slaying these animals. And uh, that's the lamb dies right here. Okay, now, let's look at the passage. And that's a little backdrop on the passage. I think it's all right now. You know, I can just say the Pharisees, the, 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 uh, the religious leaders were terrified. They were terrified that he was coming with all these people. You know, there's nothing said about the Romans, but the, the Jewish leaders were terrified. They were terrified. And they were at a point where, you know, they wanted, they had to kill him. And he was pushing them to kill him ahead of time, not after Passover, but on Passover. And that's what happened. And so let's read it. It says, as they approached that page, and Bethany at the place called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples uh, and said, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a coat tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone asks you why you're untying it, say to them, The Lord needs it. Verse 32, So those who were sent left and found it, just as he had told them, and as they were untying the coat, the owner said to them, Why are you untying the coat? And the Lord, they answered, The Lord needs it. And then verse 35, Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes over on the, on the coat like a saddle, saddle blankets, no saddle, but blankets, and it says, And they helped Jesus get on him. Uh, the King James says, And they sat Jesus there on him. I said, okay, Jesus, I think, you know, I, don't know. I, I don't know why I got bugged about that, that they had to help him on. He's not helpless. But anyway, I guess that's just language. But they set him on him. And here's the point. Now, here we go. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. We told in Matthew 21, 8, that they also were, you know, putting the palm branches and all that. You have to kind of compare the synoptics to see more or less what's going on in its fullness. But as he was going along, so you get the picture. Uh, they there, <clears throat> they, as they were going, it refers to the twelve. Plus to all those people who were following, they were moving along. 
all those people. Okay, and then verse 37, and, the, and we get down to probably the most important part. This is the meat of it. Everything else is a backdrop. It says in verse 37, Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives. So this is right here. We're up here, Mount of Olives. Now we're coming to this pathway. We're going down, and then we're going to go back up. And uh, just a little half mile. It says, Now he, he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles that they had seen. Let's stop right there for a moment. Here we have the praise of the people. And it seems that they had a lot of joy. This was a joyous celebration. They said with joy they praised the Lord with a loud voice. All these people. Now again, this is terrifying to the, to the religious leaders. They are so troubled by this. You know, it was a joyous time. Earlier on, there was a passage that at a certain point when Jesus started to go up to Jerusalem, it says he set his face toward Jerusalem like a flint, which means he was not distracted by anything. He was focused on one thing, to go up to Jerusalem. And this is what he was focused on, that cross. Nothing. That's why he came into this world. He came into this world to die, okay? That's why he came. Had he, come, had he come and worked miracles and not died? Had he come and healed the sick and not died? There would be no salvation. Those things were secondary. He came to die. He came to die. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He had to die. And that's his purpose. All right? So they were joyful because they saw a Messiah coming. And they thought of him, and all of them did, even his disciples. He's coming to throw our enemies off. You know that, don't you? Yeah. He's coming to throw, this is the Messiah we want. He's king. They do name him as king here. They quote Hezekiah, Zechariah 9.9, 9, which we'll quote in a moment. They quote Zechariah 9.9. 9. They see him as the king coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. They're, they're happy. Jesus is not happy. Because the next verse, beyond your lesson today, if you read the next verse, he wept over Jerusalem. It says he wept over Jerusalem. He wept. And then he said to Jerusalem, we'll get to it hopefully in our time today. He, he pro projected that Israel, that Jerusalem would fall, of course. And that they would be laid waste, everything. And so he, he, he was grieved. He was aggrieved. Because he knew they had rejected him. They, were reje they would reject him. It seemed really wonderful right now. They, they praised him loudly with joy. And yet, it's not going to work out that way. We'll see. But you know what? One day, I have to jump ahead a little bit. When he comes again, Revelation 19, he will be welcomed by those believers in, at the end of the tribulation. They'll cry out to him, Zechariah again. Zechariah says, they'll cry out unto him whom they pierced. They'll cry out to him, and they're going to come to him. He'll be gathered. They'll be gathered to him. And what a day that will be. The king is coming. And we could say that today. The king is coming. And this time he'll come and throw the enemies down. But then, back then, the king was coming, but the king had to die. That's the point. All right, so they shout in triumph, rejoice greatly. This is Zechariah 9.9 9 now. I'm quoting this. It says, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble, riding on the donkey or on the coat of, of an ass, the fowl of a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So we know that's not the second advent, because he does, at the second advent, in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation uh, to deliver to, to, the, to Israel, he comes to Israel. He comes to the Mount of Olives. 
on at the second advent, what's how does he come? He comes riding on a white charger, a war horse. He comes only riding on a donkey this time. And so we know this passage is not sac this is not a second ad advent passage. This passage, Zechariah 9 9, has to do with him humbly coming into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And that donkey's gone, folks. When he comes again, he's coming victorious in a different light. And the enemies of, of God will be put down. Uh, well, there's so much that we could add to that. So, all right, look at this. So, look at the next part in verse 38. All right, so he says, here's what they say this is the proclamation. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. All right? And again, uh, blessed is the king. Matthew 21, 9 says the same thing. Blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. And then it says, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Peace. Let me do this one. He's coming to them now here. And the proclamation is, we, got, we have a king, and he brings peace. Peace. You know, Jerusalem, the word means the city of peace. Jerusalem, Salam, is peace. City of peace. It's never been very peaceful. Because that's where God is, in a very real sense. And Satan is always destroyed and torn that, that place apart. And it's still the object of Satan's uh, iniqu uh, uh, his enmity, as Revelation 12 tells us. But let's go back and come back to the church age here for a minute. The king, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven. You know, Luke started his gospel off in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, with the angels proclaiming peace on earth, Peace on earth. Did you hear that? Good Peace will. on earth. Goodwill toward those in his favors. But listen, peace on earth? Now we don't get peace on earth. There's no peace on earth. And so the, the proclamation is here, peace in heaven. What's being accomplished is bringing peace to heaven. Remember last Sunday we talked about the mercy seat, the hilasmas. Jesus is going to die on the cross in his blood on the mercy seat, brings peace between God and mankind. And that peace is in heaven. Romans 5 and verse 1 says that we today, who put our faith in Christ, we have peace with God through that blood. We have peace with God. And so right now the ministry is one of reconciliation. We're saying to unsaved people, be reconciled to God. God is at peace. Peace is in heaven. And on the earth, do we have peace today? Absolutely not. There's no peace on earth. There's peace in heaven. One day there will be peace on earth when the Prince of Peace comes back to the earth. Duh. <laughs> peace on earth comes when the Prince of Peace comes back to the earth. He will bring the peace of God to the earth. But right now, there's peace in heaven. Okay? Good, good, good deal. All right? So, he says, peace in heaven. You know, Isaiah 53 and, and verse 5, he says, with his stripes, you know, he suffered, you know, his stripes were healed. And it says, the chastisement of his peace it was upon him. Our peace. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isaiah 53, verse 5. And so what was happening? Here's Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And he's bringing peace. But it's not going to be in the world. It's in heaven. The blood of Christ is now propitiated the righteousness and the justice of God. And there is peace as God offers now this peace to mankind. So our ministry today, as Paul says, that we have the ministry of reconciliation. We say to other people, oh, be ye reconciled to God. That's what we say. We say to the sinner, the lost man, you can be reconciled to God. You can have peace with God. God's already made peace. You can enter into that peace through faith in the propitiation of Christ. Okay. There it is. Peace in heaven, not on the earth, and glory in the highest heaven. Glory in the heavens. 
peace in heaven and glory in heaven. You know what happens at the second advent when Jesus comes? He comes in glory, doesn't he? His glory is displayed. That's when he comes. He comes in great clouds of great glory. And that's when, at the second advent, and, and, and that's when he brings the peace to the earth. He throws off the enemies. They're cast out, and he brings in that great glory. But now they can't see his glory because when they start working on Jesus, you know, when Mel Gibson made that movie, I've only been able to watch it one time, but he said he held back uh, when all the beatings and, and, and the bruisings of Jesus was like beyond ma a ma marring. He was marred beyond any man, any human recognition, practically. And so they say they held back. It wasn't so bad, but when you really see the movie, it's really, it's really horrible. It's hard to watch what they did to Jesus. But between the but between the sixth and the ninth hour, when the heavens was absolutely dark and no one could look on his on him, that's when our sins was placed on him, and no one could see that. God didn't allow anyone to see that. And when it was all over, he cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished, and bowed his head and went on. And waiting for the resurrection morning. Wow. Glory. One day you're going to see his glory. You had not seen it. You can see it in scripture, but one day you're going to see his glory. You know. It's in that heaven. His peace is there. Yes. Wondrous day. What a wonderful day that will be. That's yeah. right. When my Jesus, I shall last, I, I see. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. All right, that's an old hymn. Verse 39. All right, now that's pretty great. That's, that's wonderful, isn't it? Now what, is everybody happy? Oh no, verse 39, verse 39. Some of the Pharisees, not all of them, some of the Pharisees from the crowd, I told you they were in the crowd, they told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. King James says, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and he said this to them. He said, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. I've always loved that passage. King James says, uh, if they would keep silent, immediately the stones would cry out. You know, we learn from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 11 that this phrase is used in reference to a judgment. Habakkuk 2.11. That kind of, that phrase where nature cries out against man is, uh, is, 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 is tantamount to a judgment. And so uh, in the very next verse, if we read it, in the very next verse, you have judgment. Look at that. See if we can do that real quick. Well, we got good time. Uh, in verse 41 in the very next verse now because this response of Jesus indicates a judgment they say you know tell them to be quiet rebuke them don't let them proclaim him Messiah and Jesus said if they held their peace the rocks would cry out and they took that from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 11 and so in verse, so we're talking about a judgment on mankind that even nature recognizes. Verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. See that? He wept over it. And then he said, saying, verse 42, saying, if thou hast known, he's talking about the city, he says, if you have known, even you, at least in this your day, the things which belong unto your peace. See that word peace. But now they are hid from your eyes. If you'd have just known, but they're hid from your eyes. Verse 43, For the day shall come upon you that your enemies shall cast a trench about you and compass thee around and keep thee on every side. 143 days, according to Josephus, 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 144 days they besieged the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Titus, the Roman general. 143 days they cut a trench around. They entrenched it. 
They, they surrounded the city, 143 days, so everybody had to live inside there with whatever food they could get, and it was pretty bad. It was like, the, like in 586 B.C. When, they did, when the Babylonians did the same thing. They were eating mice, and you know, there was even reference to eating offspring. Pretty bad. Verse 44, it says, And shall lay you even to the ground, in other words, the city, lay it to the ground, and your children within you, and they shall not leave in you one stone upon another, because you knew not the time of your visitation. Did you know, according to Josephus, the Romans killed almost a million people. Other commentaries say 600,000. Josephus, almost a million people were slaughtered in 70 AD. These are the people that Jesus is speaking with. And then over 100,000 was taken captive. And they were all scattered and uh, the, the, the city was leveled and burned. 70 AD. It happened in 586 BC. It happened in 70 AD. And it's just a, it's just a kind of a dress rehearsal for what's going to happen. And what Jesus called in Matthew 24 the great tribulation. And there he tells them, when this happens, when you see the abomination of desolation set up in the temple, in the tribulation, what he called the great tribulation. I know the theologians don't like to have that, but that's it. And he says, when you see it, he says, don't go back in the house. If you're in the field, don't go back home. Flee. Flee. Now, in 70 A.D., they did flee. Some of them who heard Jesus' words back then. When, when Titus came before he besieged the city, they, they left the city. A lot of Jews uh, had a problem with Christians because a lot of the Christians left. They didn't stay and fight the Romans. They left to save their lives. And uh, so that was a little contention way, on, way, back, way back when. That day's coming again. So it's sort of like things happen. 586 B.C., 70 A.D., and then one more time, right before Jesus comes, because he will deliver them from their enemies. But the enemies, again, seeks to destroy Israel. You ever heard of anti-Semitism? It's still there. Okay, so he goes on in after lamenting over Jerusalem in verses 45 and 46. He casts, he kicks over the money changers. He says, and he went into the temple and he began to cast them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer. Another uh, translation is, and uh, another gospel says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, all the Gentile world. So they set up all this in the Gentile court and Jesus, because they always prevented the Gentiles from coming, you know. And so Jesus kicked it all over and declared that that part also belonged to the Gentiles, but they'd made it a den of, den of thieves because the priests ran the concessions. And the priest was, you know, made all, made all the wealth off of it. They were crooked as they could be and corrupt as they could be, and they corroded everything else. If you're corrupt, you corrode things around you. You get a bad apple, what happens to it if you got them with the rest of the apples, Jimmy? After a while, everything gets rotten. And so that's what we had. That's the lesson. Jesus uh, stirred them up. This is on just one day. Everything I've talked about, one day. One day. So he goes back to Bethany to rest. That's Monday. He comes back on Monday. He, come, he goes back on Beth, to Bethany for Monday night. He comes back on Tuesday, and he does a lot of teaching. He comes back on Tuesday night, and he rests on Wednesday all day. There's silence, scripture silence about Wednesday. And then Thursday when he comes back, you know, that's when he's going to be, uh, he's supper. That's when they have the upper room discourse, remember that? In the Garden of Eden, in the, back, uh, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, not Eden, of Gethsemane, and then the arrest, and then you're up into Friday morning, daylight, and then he's crucified on Friday and so forth. Uh, we'll, we'll look at more of this next Sunday because we have the, the crucifixion and the resurrection next Sunday morning.
Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word that lives and abides forever. And the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes intercession for us. Even this day, we thank you for all that he is and um, for the blessed hope that we have looking forward to a time when we will be face to face with him. We pray that you'll bless the, what we've heard today and make a source of blessing to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I think we have, we have the Lord's Supper this morning in church.